Okay, let's get going. All right, so good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, good evening, folks over there, because it's, uh, what time is it there? Keep forgetting. It's in the it's evening. 5 30. It's 5 p.m.? 5 30 p.m. 5 30. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's after hours for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you better make it worth their while. Okay. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> they'll be late. I grew up in Dubai. I was thinking 2 30, but then Pakistan's even more towards yeah, the east. That's right. right. That's right. So, so it's evening. It's after hours. And so they're, they're sitting around still at work uh, to do this. Well, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here with Zed. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't know how many people are online, but people will be joining asynchronously. <laughs> and so there will be a recording available for people who could, um, who wanted to listen to this afterwards. And uh, so if, in case you're in the wrong Zoom room, let me just tell you where you're supposed to be. This is uh, the Medjack Global Webinar Series and uh, based on the book Medjack, um, which is the curation of 10 years of her work on innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship in emergency medicine and other disciplines. Um, each chapter of the book becomes a conversation starter for this webinar. And uh, today we have Zed with us. Um, I'm going to introduce Zed very briefly. Zed, well, you do. You're young, so you have a you have a brief bio as it's of a now. Very short bio, yeah. <laughs> but Zed, I I've known Zed for several years, and I'll get into that fun bit later. But um, let's just. Um, uh, introduce him based on what he has provided. Dr. Zaid Altawil is a passionate innovator and a driving force in the field of emergency medicine and healthcare innovation. He is an attending physician at the Department of Emergency Medicine at Lawrence General Hospital, which is a level three trauma center in Massachusetts. Uh, Zaid brings a wealth of experience and expertise to our discussion today. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at Boston Medical Center and he is a medical graduate of the American University of Beirut. Uh, Zed's commitment to innovation and collaboration has led him to co-found the Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative, a dynamic group of emergency medicine physicians dedicated to cultivating collaborations, sharing resources, and inspiring innovative change in the field of emergency medicine. Um, Zed has been at the forefront of exploring novel approaches to healthcare challenges. He has a deep understanding of the transformative power of hackathons and fostering interdisciplinary solutions. And a chunk of our discussion today, Zed, is going to be around hackathons, OK? Um, and it's a privilege uh, to be hearing from you, your experiences, insights, and expertise as we explore the role of hackathons in teaching healthcare professionals how to innovate and drive positive change in the healthcare landscape. So chapter three of MedJack is on our experience, uh, CCIT's experience of hackathons at and past AKU. Um, so it's a great synergy here, okay? So because you're doing this event at ASAP, um, uh, we're in Philadelphia, by the way, folks, and we're live from Philly. And so Zed's running uh, this hackathon through EMEC, and he's going to talk more about about it. And and we we'll try we we will try to kind of like uh, reflect on our experience of ha of hackathons in a low middle income country setting, and then we'll see what what messages uh, or what what uh, learnings, uh, if I may that we can synergize upon and what the future holds for us where hackathons are concerned, among other things. Okay, does that kind of... Yeah, yeah it sounds you know, great. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. And now that we got the formal introduction out of the way, <laughs> tell your audience how we, like the real introduction, how we really do, got do, this. Uh, do you want to uh, tell us a bit about that? <laughs> I'll say, so I said that I remember this initially, but we actually met way back in 2014. 15, I think, 14 20, or 15. Yeah, 2014, 2015. Uh, at that time, I was doing some research in global health innovation, and I was part of the ASEP or the American College of Emergency Physicians International section. And uh, so was Assad. I was a young committee member. Uh, Assad was a veteran uh, leader in the ASEP International section. And we sort of hit it off. Something led to another, and I ended up posting Assad in my apartment in Boston <laughs> when he came for a visit. We used to, I used to live, so this was early years. I used to live right outside this salsa center. This salsa center was very loud. Its, its door was right by my window. And every Saturday, if I was not going out, I could not sleep. So I had very strong feelings. I won't say positive or negative, but very <laughs> strong. That shows up and he has, he tells me, hey, let me take you. I want to go somewhere salsa dancing. And I was like, you know what? I have just the place for you. 
That's a great story. Eh? I can't remember if you actually took me or if I actually, I was like, I can't do You it. didn't have an option. <laughs> I, the like, option was there. Yeah, the option, oh, the was, option there. was there. Yeah. I thought maybe I needed a partner. It's like, yeah. okay, so I had to come. <laughs> right? But that, <laughs> that was nine you. years ago. That was nine, nine years, years. Ago. It's been nine years. Yeah. And so you, you've come a long way, right? You've completed your residency. You did your research and global health work. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, and you've come a long way, right? So, so mashallah. And so, you know, um, really happy about, about all of that. So, so based on... Um, let, let's start off with EMEC, right? Um, that's the Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative. Tell us more about the goals and objectives of this effort and uh, how is it contributing to fostering innovation in EM? Let's start there. Yeah, excellent. So the Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative is a group of physicians that are sort of brought together with the common vision of decreasing the barriers for physicians, particularly emergency physicians, to get into innovation, but also to increase the number of physician innovators. So whatever we do along our activities and uh, uh, along, I guess, our path is in fostering those two goals, making it easier to innovate and making it uh, or increasing the number of physicians. Um, Most of us are physicians that are interested in innovation in one form or another, either interested in the startup realm or creating devices or improving and innovating clinical workflows within your own hospital. Um, But we're sort of brought together with this common goal. Um, The impetus for the beginning of EMIC was those very same difficulties. So I had been, or I started up a bunch of innovation projects before, during residency, prior to residency and afterwards. And one of the common themes was, A, um, this is not clinical work and it's not research. Mm. So nobody knows what you're talking about. Mm. And it's very hard to introduce the concept of rapid iteration in a environment that is not accustomed to rapid iteration. Not for a positive or a negative, it's just not accustomed to it, right? A system is built to produce the results it was designed to produce, right? Um, so we, I was running into a lot of these roadblocks, whether through bureaucracy, through uh, uh, leading change, um, that was kind of frustrating. And I thought, hey, I'm by myself, I'm pretty driven, I'm pretty goal oriented, and I don't give up. Uh, but A, not necessarily everybody else is that way, but B, even if a good majority was, I'm still losing out on the perspectives of the minority that might not be able to push through and try to make their own path. So I figured this is a problem that we could solve. Um, Always looking for the problem, right? This is a problem that we could solve. And uh, funny enough, my co-founder, he was on the other side of the country. So I'm based in Boston. He was based in uh, UCSF in uh, California. And he was running through the same things too. We met at a conference, uh, sort of like virtually. And by, you know, talking to each other, seeing the same... uh, problem that was happening, we decided, hey, let's do something about it. And so that was where Emic was born. All oh, right. Fascinating. So that's, that's you know, just, just listening to you about, about uh, the, the challenges uh, could be real and could be perceived even at times, right? So uh, I'm so um, uh, in agreement with, with, with the challenges when you have a, a framework, which is innovation, whether it's for emergency medicine or some other discipline or field of medicine, I think people are just not ready for it. Uh, and uh, the traditional approach tends to be research driven. So you start off with the research question or uh, hypothesis and you go further from there. And in this case, rapid iteration, rapid prototyping, testing and iterative cycles of that. So that requires you to just implement first without necessarily having uh, evidence that's going to work. And then you build up from there and then you can get into research. And that's what I've been telling people as well over here at ASAP and in the national um, section platform as well. Um, so while I'm listening to you, I think I can completely kind of like, uh, you know, um, sympathize with you or empathize with you. And so regardless, you've stuck to it. So I think that um, that takes grit, takes courage. And uh, for a young person who has decided, okay, this is what I want to pursue versus the more popular um, aspect of emergency medicine, which would be research right, and research grants. So um, they both sort of, they both need each other, Mm -hmm. like without the backbone of evidence-based medicine, especially since we're dealing with uh, patients' lives, Mm -hmm. you can't really act without having a solid base of research that can help you. But at the same time, our challenges are really big Mm -hmm. and some of them are very hard. 
and you need to have different approaches. Right? We need both of them, mm -hmm. as well as a good strong backbone in clinical medicine. But you know, I guess I don't know if you're taking from like uh, strategy and games and everything. You have to have more than one front. Yeah, you have yeah. to be able to attack a problem for every single from front possible. Yeah. Innovation is one front. Research is another front. Direct patient care, because this is what we've got into yeah. medicine for, is another front. Yeah. And hopefully in the future, there'll be a fourth and a fifth and a sixth front yeah. for us to be able to tackle those problems. That's they're, good. they're very hard. Complex problems, right? So yeah, that's, that's a great way of looking at it. And, and, I, and yeah, so uh, I'm also always cautious and I'm not saying that research is not important. It is important. Um, and, and when we've tried implementing, uh, we tend not to uh, get into direct patient care related innovation mm -hmm. upfront without having the background or the evidence or you know the research done. So I'm talking about process uh, innovation at times and education frameworks in emergency medicine, for example, right? So yeah. you could be innovative and creative over there without necessarily having tons of evidence at that particular strategy for educating residents or students or whoever is going to work or not. Yeah. And you can be completely thinking outside of the box or act thinking and acting outside of the box. But that's also the realm of innovation. So I think I'm, our, our strategy has also been to kind of like redefine innovation for 100%. people, right? for ourselves as, a, as well as for others as well, so that you don't keep thinking about it the same way, even for innovation itself, right? Yeah. So innovate, innovating within innovation as well, if I may. So, okay, great. So, so tell, uh, just, just a follow up question on that EMIC thing, because um, it's based on you know the website, I've, I've gone through the content, I've, I've signed up with the EMIC as well. And, and I hope that the audience considers because this is open to anybody, right? Oh, so, yes, so it's it's a global thing, right? So, but but, but most of these things tend tend to be high tech oriented at times. I feel, and even the budgets are required. Um, and um, and we're more into a global emergency medicine kind of an arena. At least myself, I just feel that you know, at times that we've got to do these processes without necessarily having any money at times, even. But we just go ahead and implement, right? So. Has in based on Emex experience, um, do you think these frameworks um, would work for any kind of setting, LMIC, high income HIC, or is it more bent towards the US? I think you know it's funny when I started when I started with my research. So I was in Boston earlier for research doing global health innovation. Mm. Um, this was at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. I was working with the Division of Global Health and Human Rights. And we were, what we were doing was implementing low-cost innovations to help impact uh, maternal and fetal mortality. These were very cheap devices. Cheap is actually the wrong word. I would say like economically efficient. Very economically efficient devices that would uh, save a mother's life from postpartum hem hemorrhage essentially for $5. Mm. It was mind blowing. Five dollars to save a life, right? And we were doing this in a high income country like the United States. But what we found through going through the data and as part of our literature searches uh, and just part of the general experience in that field was that a lot of the challenges that were faced in, for example, Kenya, where a lot of our work was done, were not necessarily off base from some of the challenges that some communities, a lot of communities in the United States were facing namely timely access to good care, mm. right? And having the resources to deal with the situation when it happens. Mm. So we pivoted, or at least I would say five, 10% of our efforts pivoted into how can we employ these interventions here in the United States? Mm. So you see a low cost intervention that was initially developed for the low middle income space being transitioned to the high income space. Mm. So I think the lines between at least implementation and development of technology have been blurred mm. between high income, low middle income countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of place for synergy. At the same time, I think that we should separate the spending of money with the actual requirement uh, to develop something. Sure, you have the FDA, you have a lot of regulatory processes that you, go, you have to go through in the United States that make it more challenging, at mm -hmm. least from a timeline sphere than other places. Uh, but the concept still holds. Mm -hmm. Why not look for things that are economically efficient? Mm -hmm. We need to develop strategies that are more successful at a lower cost. I think we stand to learn something from the global health sphere. I'm a space guy. I mm -hmm. love space. And the fact that you know, our brothers in India can launch a rocket 
or a fraction of the cost that it, co uh, that it uh, costs in the United States is mind blowing, right? And it's space. That's the biggest sphere mm. of, that's the biggest division between a high income country and a middle income country, right? You're talking about rocket science and India can still launch something there for a fraction of the cost, yeah. right? They yeah. got to the moon. Yeah. So that, what I mean to say by that is uh, we should always be working from a lens of how can we be the most effective and most efficient and how can we learn lessons from each other? Yeah. High middle income countries have their divisions, uh, but I think we should look for the commonality. Yeah. At least my, I'm no, no, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. And while you were uh, describing uh, the, uh, the the example of India, right, and going and uh, the space mission, fabulous example, right? So uh, they would do things at a at a fraction of the cost otherwise. So. Jagard innovation is something you might have come across in the book or in the chapter that you read. And so Jagard innovation frameworks is something that we've developed uh, de novo at, at, uh, at AKU. And uh, it's not something that uh, well, we weren't the first people to develop it, but that concept, that, that mindset, that you can have frugal innovation or low cost, uh, low tech uh, innovation and, uh, and still show really good outcomes. That's out there, right? So money, I think that becomes like more of a limitation for us in the minds that we don't have enough or we have too little, either ways. So so what you're describing makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that. Okay, so for, for people um, who are listening in, um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to um, leave those in the chat box and we, will, uh, we, we want to interrupt our conversation. We want to get your questions or comments addressed. Okay, so we want this to be interactive in case we can't. I won't be able to hear you, but anyways, put in, type in your comments or your questions, and we're happy to. Um, I'm happy to redirect them to Zed because I will not be able to answer. No, that. <laughs> and okay, so Zed, um, um, while you let, let's let's kind of like um, unpack this global, let's say global EM innovation uh, aspect a bit further. So. While you were talking about these different issues, I the the the, the phrase that comes to my mind is social determinants of health. Um, I how familiar are you with with those social determinants and emer in emergency medicine, particularly you've been you've trained in Boston, uh, you've yeah. worked over there, and you're still working in Massachusetts, right? Uh, and you're very familiar with with the U.S. healthcare system. So um, the social determinants have become exceedingly important, in my opinion, and uh, not just for emergency medicine, for any field of medicine. Uh, what's your take on that? And how do you think innovation uh, could help where uh, that kind of social medicine, if I may, yeah, or upstream medicine is concerned? So it's a very important instrumental building block of what constitutes a patient's health. I trained at Boston Medical Center, which is a safety net hospital. So 80% uh, or even 85% of our patients receive some sort of uh, either Medicare or Medicaid, Medicaid, I should say. Um, and otherwise don't have the funds to be able to uh, uh, pay for their medical care or have commercial insurance. Uh, a lot of them also have issues with substance use disorder, housing insecurity, food insecurity. So a big portion of my training was treating patients that uh, whose health concerns may not have been a direct result of behavior or genetics, but rather the surrounding environment. So part of what my training was, I think it's a great challenging aspect of medicine and the challenges in it are equal to, if not in some respects, exceeding or meeting uh, challenges with regards to direct, uh, I would say, disease specific interventions. In terms of how innovation could work. In that field, uh, I think it is a space where some of the more creative interventions uh, can come out. Uh, the fact that it gives us more avenues of patient health to treat is a bit helpful, right? So it's it's very hard to innovate in drug delivery for medications. That's a multi-year-long process, needs millions of dollars. Social determinants health also needs a lot of funding, uh, but a lot of the interventions can be a bit more grassroots. Uh, can affect communities as opposed to uh, along populations, or at least communities as a stepping stone to a population, depending on where you're looking. And so it lends itself to a lot of interesting um, places to intervene. For example, during one of my, so the first hackathon I organized was in 2018. It was an emergency medicine, one of the first few, I believe. 
and one of the tracts was in social determinants. Mm -hmm. So tackling substance use disorder, for example, uh, a lot of the issues that were surrounding patients were uh, inability to access patients where they are and treating overdoses as they happen. Right? So outside of the patient presenting to an emergency department in example, bathrooms or in public spaces. And one of the, the uh, interventions was with regards to how do you uncover an overdose mm. that's happening. Another intervention was in mapping hotspots of disease as they relate to the zip code around the city. So wow. having heat maps that tell you that you know, this particular area is a hotspot for, and this was pre-COVID, a hotspot for a respiratory disease or asthma or that sort of thing. And that leads you to think, okay, what are the community-wide or what are the environmental factors? What are, what are the issues that are impacting this community that are causing it to be that way? And then other projects related to food insecurity, uh, temporary housing, realizing that all of these interventions impact a patient's health because if you don't have a place to sleep for the night, you don't have a place to store your medications, right? Your medications uh, are apt to get stolen. If you don't have a place to have your food, you can't feed yourself as you're trying to recover from an illness. Uh, if you can't have a place to store your food, you can't, uh, your clothes, sorry, you can't get them clean. You can't be clean to go to the interview. The interview leads to not having a salary and then you don't have the money or the funds to take care of yourself medically. So it all intertwines. And you can see how in every step of the way, there are multiple places where you can intervene. And so the possibilities are much wider and lend themselves to be much more creative. That's, yeah, exactly right. So um, a lot more creative, a lot more fun uh, yeah. figuring out those, um, unpacking those problems and frustrating, right? So, because those, so they're um, heavily intertwined, right? So um, there's, you know, what, what, what came to my mind was uh, social innovation and entrepreneurship, right? So a lot of these things, uh, to tackle them, you could have simple, straightforward grassroots, as you mentioned, frameworks. And that could be entirely within the realm of social innovation and entrepreneurship, and 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 those could be really powerful. Um, that's been our experience in Pakistan as well. So um, let's let's get a bit into hackathons as well, right? So um, tell us more about uh, the hackathon that you're leading over here. Yeah, of course. Very excited about this hackathon. So it's a, a collaboration between EMIC, the Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative, and the American College of Emergency Physicians. Um, also like the health information technology section. And it's basically in line with our vision of increasing the number of physician entrepreneurs. It's how do we help nurture the ecosystem of innovation within emergency medicine and allow an opportunity for young physicians, older physicians and everything in between to flex their uh, innovation muscles. So we it's a two pronged track. It's in its second year. Our involvement was this year. It's two prongs. So one is the innovation challenge. Um, this was something that EMIC brought in a bit different than your traditional hackathon yeah. because it took into mind physicians' busy schedules and the baseline knowledge that we expect of them. So it was over six weeks. Uh, participants can uh, iterate on their pitches with a pitch being the only requirement, so not an end-to-end -end solution. And over the six weeks, we had a accompanying design speaker series uh, that dealt with topics from how to start a company as a physician to how do you uh, create a business development plan to how do you do clinical need finding or technology design. And together, leading up to the three days here in ASAP where the participants will refine their pitches and then present them tomorrow. And then you have also as well, your more traditional hackathon that is shorter in duration, more challenging in my mind for a bit for the more of the veterans uh, but also beginners, where you come down to for three days and try to come up with an end-to-end -end, uh, solution or your MVP, minimal viable product, to uh, present tomorrow as well. And the theme for this year is the hospital at home space. Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. So um, just before I forget, right? So um, we we've, we've been doing this for several years, um, as you're aware, and we've done different. Um, iterations of hackathons as well, similar to what mm -hmm. you're describing. So we've had face-to-face -face weekend of hacking and then going home after that to all the way to like a few weeks of um, virtual engagement. 
and then uh, face to face for the yeah, actual nice. event, yeah. right? So we've done those as well, uh, two entirely virtual. And COVID uh, is a great example for us because we did our um, entirely virtual hackathon during uh, in 2020, and it was called the Jagard Innovation. I mentioned earlier, Jagard Innovation Challenge. And so um, uh, our team or teams of people that we, we've been kind of um, networking with, so if you or EMEG is ever, ever interested in um, set of mentors or advisors or whoever, so I think we'll be able to kind of contribute to that as well if you just keep that in mind. And uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be a great honor for us actually also to share well. what our learnings are. Well. I mean. So I've yeah. been following Medjack oh, yeah. and uh, for years, uh, following you on social media and seeing the things you're up to, and it's very inspiring. Thank you. There's a lot of challenges that you face. I'm sure whatever, I mean, bureaucracy is everywhere. Uh, a lot of, so I grew up in the Middle East, uh, not as far as Pakistan, but I grew up in Dubai, uh, but I'm Palestinian by origin. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, whenever we try to solve solutions with out-of-the-box thinking, we always used to be met with, no one's gonna pay for this or we have bigger problems to deal with, or this is not the time, or who are you? The biggest question, who are you, <laughs> right? Like, what are your chops? Who do you know? Yeah. So um, I recognize fully the challenges that you face. So for you to do something like this and for your team and for the participants in those uh, innovation marathons to be able to do something like this, in a more difficult set of challenges is amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, tell us, uh, tell us uh, like maybe the top, one or two challenges that you faced uh, with the uh, with the hackathons in emergency medicine. Uh, <laughs> just just two. <laughs> just two. Okay. That's right. You can go yeah. ahead. <laughs> um, so let me. Okay. So I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to squeeze in a process that is multi-year into a weekend or into six weeks, mm -hmm. right? I mean that's part of the fun of it, but trying to go over your innovations or go over your plan, your business plan, your every every part of what constitutes a minimal, uh, the road to MVP takes months on its own, right? Not years. Um, so squeezing that in a weekend is tough. Um, logistics are always difficult because every time you, you start a hackathon, presumably you're picking a new location, a new theme, uh, a new set of circumstances, and I'm sure you've been, right? Uh, there's always something that's gonna go wrong. <laughs> I would say specific to emergency medicine. Uh, so hackathons in medicine are not a new concept. Yeah. They've been going on for a few years. Mm -hmm. Started with MIT hacking medicine and a bit before that and during. Uh, in emergency medicine, it is not as common and it's still something new. So uh, getting enough excitement or getting enough participants that would travel to participate as a challenge. And it might not be from interest, but it could be also from like the logistics, mm. right? Uh, we're talking about a specialty that's spread across America and you're trying to get them all in one space, right? That's pretty hard as mm. opposed to doing it in one city, mm -hmm. right? If you wanna do it in one city, the problem is you only have like three or four programs. So you're talking about maybe 40 students maximum and having their busy schedules a hackathon with five people is nice, but it not, not yeah. might be like the way you want it to be. Um, so that's a challenge there. Cost is always an issue. Whenever something is new, it's always hard to get funding for it. Thankfully, we've been able to quote unquote bootstrap our hackathon and run it for very cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the issues that we would like to work on. I would say, uh, given we're doing it at a conference, uh, the ability to attract a multidisciplinary uh, participant pool is challenging, right? Um, as opposed to a hackathon that you can do in the middle of a city, for example, at a brewery or at a restaurant or at a small event space, you're asking participants to come to a conference that's specific to one uh, medical specialty. So that's hard. Mm. So now you're talking about a pool of physicians who also have coding or developing experience, physicians who also have business development experience. Mm. So it's a bit hard to get that diverse pool. Um, I can go on for no, that's good. two hours. I, can, <laughs> yeah, I, I, got, I got a lot of... No, no, that's uh, good. That's, it, it gets... Oops, sorry. I just started, right? No, no, it's working. Okay. Right. So, so um, th th tell us a bit more about your experience of like what happens after the hackathon because that's okay. been a major challenge for us. Okay. Right? How do you... Because our, our hacker pool, 
if I may, is students for the most part. And these are, these are very excited, excitable medical students and nursing students, because we have a school, a very dynamic school of nursing as well at AKU, uh, along with the medical college. And then we've got faculty of arts and sciences. Now we've got humanities students as well that, that potentially might get interested as well in, in, a, in, a, in a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary kind of a hackathon. But these people are excited because, um, you know, it's, a, it's that weekend of hacking or even a few weeks of like uh, team-based hacking, let's say. Um, but how do you keep them committed to a startup mm -hmm. in the post hackathon period? Because that's where we, I don't think we tend to do really well. We, we can, we can, we can stretch it to maybe a few months, let's say, because we have a, we have a, an incubation, uh, cohort, uh, or curriculum. And so it's a milestone based thing. So they take the MVP through all of that and then get it to a stage, which is, I would say early stage or early stage business incubation, let's say, you know, that, that, that's about all we can offer or we commit to as CCIT, the team, lead, the team itself. Past that, it's late stage incubation, acceleration. We don't have the capacity, right? right? What, are, what do you do with those teams and once they're done with the hack? So I think it's a two-part question. I think one is more a statement, one is more a question mm -hmm. my, or an answer to a question from my end. I think, I th think you're being very hard on yourself and not you. <laughs> I think the hackathon space in general is being very hard on itself, expecting every cohort yeah, point. to lead to multiple companies, right? It's like expecting every medical school uh, graduating class to have a groundbreaking researcher or every physics class to have a Nobel Prize winner. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, uh, it's a unfair yeah. uh, expectation. Uh, my sense is it's the actual activity yeah. That is really the uh, the drive that that, that is the, the end goal in itself, and everything that you get after that is a plus. I call it cream, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to introduce people to a new way mm -hmm. of learning. Mm -hmm. You're trying to give them a new framework for collaboration, and putting them through a short-term crucible for that gives them a lens into what the real world of innovation and uh, startups and whatever uh, has to offer, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's very difficult to go from a cohort and it's very difficult to have metrics that give you an accurate representation of the educational value that uh, hackathons provide. And I tell you this not because I had this answer on the, on the back of my hand, right? It's more of, I've struggled with this as well how do you carry a concept to a company and realize through the process that I think I'm being unfair on the participants themselves and on myself as someone trying to do the same. Now, the second part is you have a con you have a company or you have a concept that has the trifecta of, you have a great idea, but more importantly, uh, or a great problem to solve, but more importantly, a great team and great access to funds. Uh, this is something that we're working on for our you know, next one or two year pipeline with Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative and further is how to take them to the next step. How do you get them the uh, mentorship, most importantly, to be able to guide them into developing their minimum viable product further? How do you get them access to the funding sources? Uh, how, you know, investors, VCs, how to approach friends and family, which is probably the first yeah. uh, place you need to look uh, and so on and so forth. So I won't say we have the uh, solution. We are working on the framework to do yeah. that. Much more. Let's let's partner up. <laughs> because yeah, I, think, okay. I think that I think that's where our learning again, right? So from from from, uh, and and that's a that's a fabulous point. Though I I, I um, echo that sentiment and thank you for kind of you know endorsing that as well because we tend to be really harsh on ourselves, and it's not this just is why we're in this field. Yeah, because yeah. we like as as the innovation incubation hub. It's not meant to be our responsibility to take them all the way across. You're right, you know. And but but I think what happens at times is that I'm I'm being a bit critical about the establishment, quote unquote, of yeah. the context that the university or the university hospital or the people who are the powers that be yeah. expect. Oh well, you've been doing these hackathons for several years. Show us some examples. Well, right. wait a minute. You know that's and that's what we've been telling them, whether they want to listen or not. You know, not just my workplace, but this is in general academic Everybody. university teaching hospitals, yeah. let's say, that it's the activity in and of itself 
is creative, it's innovative, it's a lot of fun. It's a very different way of um, approaching education frameworks. Here, yeah. Right. So it's it's non pedagogical. It's not pedantic. It's very, but it, there's so much education that happens, teaching, learning that happens right. during hackathons, and I'm fascinated by that process as well. I think um, not to interrupt you, no, no, great, but great. I think um, part of that is our fault. Mm. Um, Mm. Because when we came and talked to our, and I'm not saying this is not a challenge, mm. right? And this is, again, uh, my fault mm. as well, as somebody who's participating in this ecosystem, is that we went to our, uh, quote unquote, as you call them, the powers that be, mm -hmm. and told them, hey, we want to do a hackathon. Well, what's a hackathon? Well, it's a place where you come together as a team, solve problems, and create startups. Mm. We're like, okay. Where are the startups? Yeah. <laughs> so they didn't even know this concept, and we told them the end result is a startup. Yeah. The end result is a company. And every time you hear the word startup, you hear unicorn, right? Mm -hmm. You don't yeah, hear right. failure, yeah. right? So you hear unicorn, billion dollar valuation. So I think it's our responsibility as this community to redefine the metrics of what constitutes success in our sphere, not to lie to each other and say, like, okay, we're not producing what we wanted. Let's try to come up with something else and pad the, the numbers, but actually defining what do successful metrics when it comes to driving innovation, right? Similar to like the academic world, you know, is there something about production? Um, when you're taking a class, you're not defining your class by who gets the A's, right? Mm. You're, you're defining like, how do I arm my students, hopefully, with the tools they need to go to the next step in their life? I think we just need to have a frank conversation with ourselves as a community about what constitutes success and then use that yeah. when we're approaching the powers that be. And either that they're still going to have objections then. And that's why <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, those are great points. Thanks. Uh, thanks for you know, mentioning all of those things. I, I don't think, and, and just, just to kind of like kind of compare this because I'm trained as a clinical researcher, I'm trained as a benchmark mm -hmm. researcher and a clinical researcher. Yeah. Um, when, when you, when you have a grant, right? Uh, nobody asks you those questions. Nobody says, okay, what are the outcomes that you're really showing? Or, or, you know, Cause the grant, you, you, you've got money, you've got protected time, let's say, right? So you publish your data and you publish your findings and paper gets out there, but what's the impact? Right? So this might take us off on a tangent, but I think, I think redefining or re, um, unpacking impact. Uh, of the work that we do, whether it's grant centric, grant oriented, or it's innovation centric, innovation oriented, or something else for that matter, right? So, what's the impact, and who's defining that impact? We ourselves, as the uh, as a researcher, innovator, educator, clinician, or is it going to be them? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, what I mean I, by I them, think, right? I think so, it's going to be whoever's paying for it. <laughs> so, okay, right? so. Um, so, with the grant writing and research, it's the same thing. Like. I'm trying to give you money. This is what I want to see out of it. Yeah. Um, that's why, unfortunately, we've, as for example, in research, we've diverted not to what's the most biggest clinical impact, but it's what's will win you the most grants. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's why nobody publishes negative results. Yeah. It's always positive. Yeah. Um, it's because it would get what gets you the money. Um, so that's a very hard question. Yeah. Uh, or a hard challenge, yeah. I should say. How do you uh, define an impact that? somebody who's paying for you mm. to do this uh, realizes it. Mm -hmm. It seems that in the tech industry, uh, there's enough of the people who have been through this process that have uh, achieved successful startups mm -hmm. that they realize the value. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you see a lot of hackathons funded by Google, a lot of hackathons mm. funded by Microsoft, mm -hmm. or because they've been in that ecosystem, they benefited from it. Right? I think Gmail was part of mm. something where they just came up with how to solve mm. problems within Google, or at least the free collaboration that they had within mm. Google. So they've benefited from it, so they see the value of paying it forward. And this is what we're trying to do is hope is what they tried to do decades ago. How mm. do you breed the ecosystem so that enough of us are out there that we realize the value of what we're trying to do mm. and we're able to uh, support it? And mm -hmm. That's why part of my job with EMIC is to reach out to people who are successful right now. Mm. Like, hey, how are you going to give back? Are mm -hmm. you available to mentor people? Are yeah. you available to support us? You know what it was like. Yeah. <laughs> I tell people all the time, for every person like you that's sold a company or started a successful product, think about the 50, 100, 200 people that gave up earlier because it was just too hard. Yeah. And then the next part, think about how you're going to support them. Cool. Right? Yeah. And in 20 years, yeah. 10 years, yeah. if the ecosystem is better, I think we'll see yeah. a bit more of an understanding. Of that's, uh, that's exciting.
it's very positive and uh, and uh, hats off to you right so okay there's a question here from dr sidra kamal um how would you reimagine the domain of em if we blend human centered design thinking with innovation in lmics and uh, high income countries how would i blend it. innovation with its medicine R design thinking yeah human centered design thinking i think it's so by imagining yourself in the shoes sorry of, just, just, just let's back up Why, oh, yeah. not everybody might be familiar with, with design thinking frameworks if you so, want I mean, to design, explain a bit about that design so. thinking framework if i would boil it down to a base idea is about empathy yeah, yeah you start off with empathy right yeah. and i think that's the main issue that's mm -hmm. the main driver of mm -hmm. design thinking. how do you empathize with your end user mm -hmm with the person who is uh, gonna use your intervention mm -hmm. and then working backwards from there, mm -hmm. right? It's not designing a solution that mm -hmm. it's uh, to use your specific tool set mm -hmm. and what you imagine something cool would be, mm -hmm. but rather thinking of what is my end user, the patient, physician, health system, community, what's their problem and how do I right. solve it? And then employing rapid cycles of iteration in between to get there. Yeah. Rapid cycles of iteration mean you know, uh, pose, test, yeah. results, repeat, pose, test, results, yeah. repeat, going to the solution we're getting to. Um, I think that in emergency medicine, we're unique in our ability to employ this. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we do is how to employ very limited information mm -hmm. to solve a complex problem, right? You're in the resuscitation room and if you're lucky, you get EMS that tells you a full story, but sometimes EMS or emergency medical services, they don't have the full story. Um, and so you see somebody with low blood pressure, low uh, or very high heart rate, they look pale and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do, right? And you can spend 20 minutes thinking about what the disease process mm. occurred to get you there, or you can say, I have low blood pressure, high heart rate, color, let me work on these, and I'll go back and get a full picture, mm. right? So we're unique in that aspect. You don't get a consultation of, this is the problem, right. please solve it. Or what do you think, is it the problem or not? You get a, who knows, yeah. deal with it. <laughs> and so that puts us in a unique situation to be, because we're already accustomed yeah. to this. Now, how that can uh, apply to low and middle income countries and high middle income countries, frankly, is by empathizing with your patient's needs, uh, you find a solution that can um, help them. And I can go from very simple to very complex, right? The simplest way, that has ha happened in my practice, for example, is I had a specific set of patients that spoke in a different way. So I'm heavy from him as far as spoke different languages, right? So Spanish, Asian Creole, uh, Portuguese. And I was printing like stacks of paperwork of discharge instructions for them um, that didn't make sense. They can't read English, mm. right? Now, we could have waited for somebody to solve this problem at the time there are better options now, but at the time there was, none, right? So, okay, what are the technological tools at my disposal mm. that I could apply? For us, it was Google Translate, mm. right? You copy paste what was there, you put it in there, right? With time, we found that, okay, there's a, uh, there's a lot of errors that were being translated, mm. right? So then we backed off and said, okay, what's a better solution? Let's try to go find discharge paperwork that's on somebody else who wrote that we know is good, right? That is not available for every single thing that you want to communicate. That problem was solved now with large language models. Yeah. And, you know, specifically like employed by, or just the training that Google Trans uh, Translate goes to. So now, yes, we know that barring gender specific uh, differences mm -hmm. in what you're trying to say, it actually works, right? So despite the fact that this was not an official hackathon or it's not an official situation, but as a physician, mm. I'm thinking, okay, what is the problem? My patient isn't getting um, the discharge instructions they need in their language. How do I solve this problem? Thinking of what are all the tools mm. that are available for me and thinking from a different lens, right? I'm not thinking what are the tools that are available for me that have been provided by my hospital system. Mm. Thinking what are the tools I have in general? Yeah. What can I learn from something else and yeah. apply it, yeah. right? Very simple example, and we can go more complex, but as emergency physicians, we're always faced with a situation where we have to do something. The solutions are not always there. So just employing that design methodology of empathizing 
ideating and testing and get to something that's better for you. Excellent, fascinating. So thanks, and that's a great summary, by the way, folks, of design thinking and how applicable it is to emergency medicine, and that's what I felt as well. Um, and that's uh, putting in a for, for that question. Uh, for, uh, great question, Sidra, and uh, putting in a plug for folks to consider emergency medicine as a field because you definitely have potential to innovate, uh, create, and be start startup oriented as well as, you, as you're demonstrating. So we got a few more questions over here uh, and see if, uh, how much time do we have. We'll be doing well on time. So um, that's an interesting question. So how does one define success for an innovation incubation hub that is process driven? So process versus product, perhaps because product innovation is more expensive, process innovation might not require all of that expense. Well, I think it can almost be a bit easier or not easier if they're all challenging, but I think it might be more quantifiable, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the reason you have a process is you're trying to affect an outcome, mm -hmm. right? For example, I'm having X amount of number of admissions for heart failure and I want to increase that or uh, uh, X utilization of beds in the emergency department and I can decrease that. Am I, am I understanding the question? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, okay. Yeah. Um, so at least uh, starting by good patient-centered patient mm -hmm. metrics mm -hmm. for what you uh, are trying to affect mm -hmm. and then trying to come up with iterations that could uh, help improve that. This is something that is thankfully very well developed in the quality improvement Go ahead. QI. Right. So yeah. QI yeah. and innovation really go hand in hand yeah. because QI is trying to, and QI came from, or at least the processes that we see of rapid iteration. Yeah. Actually, PDSA cycles. Exactly. Yeah. Right. PDSA cycles. This was all started, you know, by you know pioneers in the Institute uh, of Medicine mm -hmm. and um, have been thankfully very well tested. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of. Um, resources in IOM that can help you with that, mm -hmm. how to create a PDSA cycle. Mm -hmm. So after PDSA cycle, I think it's... Land Do Study Act. Land Do Study Act, right? Mm -hmm. And if you actually Google the, or search, sorry, for the PDSA on Im Google image, you'll see what looks like the exact image of rapid iteration. Yeah, right? it does. Circles, yeah. circles, circles. Pretty circles, much, circles. yes. And, and there they can give you the framework for how to see how your process is improved. As long as you take the exact, design thinking, and they speak a lot about design thinking in PDSA cycle as well, but the mindset of empathizing with your end, yeah. right? We do this a lot of research, research realm as well. Yeah. We look for disease-oriented outcomes mm -hmm. or lab-oriented mm -hmm. outcomes or um, other oriented outcomes and mm -hmm. sometimes avoid or not look at patient-oriented yeah. outcomes, right? Is this leading to a direct patient uh, outcome? So framing your mindset from the end user, which is your patient, how do I have an effect and outcome through my processes that can improve their experience? Yeah. I'm going through already established methods of uh, iteration. I think we'll get to a good point. Yeah, excellent, great. That's uh, that's really good. Uh, as an example, uh, you kind of like incorporated clinical medicine, let's say, uh, as uh, to answer that question. And <clears throat> just wanted to add that. Um, there's also uh, ability with this process to um, enhance the staff experience or uh, the you know the faculty experience or the student experience and whatnot, right? depending on a very multidisciplinary environment of a teaching hospital. Yeah. Right? So, and so that's where all that applies. Yeah. Specifically, yeah. like how can we do hackathons within yeah. departments yeah. to just help them at least think about their yeah. problems. And and you can have and and you probably already have established metrics uh, to follow to gauge the impact. It's, I, mean, I mentioned impact earlier, but I think this is, it's its linked to this question, right? So how do you define the success for an innovation incubation hub that is process driven? And the process over here would be a hackathon, for yeah. example, right? Or it could be a de design thinking sprint. It could be an innovation challenge. And so you, we, like we have for CCIT, develop these metrics that we can gauge. I think honestly, the metric, um, okay, so if we're looking at direct metrics, it's, you can always do your pre-post intervention. You want right? good, yeah. Um, I think it's also, um, I think by the number. Mm -hmm. So uh, saying like we have X amount of people that have gone through this yeah, course and are now armed yeah. with the tools to improve. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's difficult. It's sort of saying, like saying, I mean, you could gauge how many process, how many of your graduates start to start their own QI. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of the 
same challenges we see, for example, in the simulation field. Like, mm -hmm. how do you gauge the lives saved by someone going through That's a talk point. simulation training? Yeah. Uh, so I think saying, uh, trying to track the output of your graduates, and by graduates, I mean people who went through the yeah. program, seeing what QI initiatives they've mm -hmm. uh, achieved. Hopefully through there, you're able to track if their initiatives are successful, what are the actual specific dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. um, but um, aside from that, I think it'll be very challenging. Yeah. And to be fair, I'm not an expert in the process innovation. Yeah. Um, a lot of my co-fellows and our co-founders and uh, colleagues have more of an interest in that sphere. Um, and they would be able to answer that question. No, that's fine. Right. We could always have like a follow-up discussion at some point, and you would have become an expert. Yeah. Right. Do you suffer from it? <laughs> this is a tangent. Imposter syndrome. Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same here. Guilty of it. Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> I think you'd be hard pressed. So in my mind, I would have less faith in a person that doesn't have it. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and I don't know if that's fair to say. I think if you believe that you know what you're doing, uh, that you are suffering from the Dunning Kruger effect, and that you need to reevaluate your Mm. Uh, it's funny the more you learn and the more you do the more you realize you don't know mm. and so i think imposter syndrome is good but i think you need to have mitigation strategies mm. and mitigation strategies is just uh some of them can be just put yourself out there and try and fail. try and fail. Yeah. i think imposter syndrome is you know that's the fear of being found out mm. by others and uh, a lot of times, or at least experience has shown me that I'm a person suffering from imposter syndrome, surrounded by people suffering from imposter syndrome, <laughs> and are all worried about being found out. You know? So, uh, so we're uh, all going to go down. <laughs> yeah, and part of so one of my strategies, honestly, is embracing it. Embracing. Like, yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know. Or excuse me, this doesn't sound like a. Uh, and honestly, um, people tend to misjudge you and underestimate you anyway. Yeah. So if you feel like, yes, everybody thinks that I don't know what I'm talking about, and then just go to the next step of, okay, and now what? <laughs> uh, I think it's a good strategy. That's a good. Okay, here we've got some more things here. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, how do you see the role of technology such as telemedicine and digital health solutions evolving in EM? And what opportunities do you foresee for innovation in this area? Also, do you think that hackathons have leveraged uh, themselves from tech. Um, so I'll answer the first question yeah. and then I'll ask for a re-clarification about the second okay. question because I missed that last part. Um, so I think uh, this is going to be a huge uh, burst of creativity in this field and it's happening already. I think digital health and telehealth is already becoming a big part of emergency medicine and I hope that we'd be able to um, uh, embrace it, uh, specifically as emergency medicine faces its challenges in the future. So um, ways I see digital health and telehealth uh, impacting emergency medicine is, of course, through uh, you know multiple aspects. You could have the post-emergency medicine visit care, mm -hmm. right? So um, how do you follow up with somebody after yeah. they've seen you mm -hmm. and make sure that they... Um, are adhering to their medication regimen and getting the post uh, hospital visit care that they need. Mm -hmm. You know, we pride ourselves in emergency medicine on the fact that you know we don't really deal with the continuity of care. Um, but I think in a rapidly evolving world, I think it's important that yeah. we do just to mm -hmm. make sure that we're actually affecting change in behavior and improving patient uh, outcomes. Um, before the emergency department visit, I think a large there's a large, large, large role for telehealth to play mm. in terms of the patients that would otherwise have come to the emergency department for, and this is a, I think a demeaning term for like non-emergent complaints. Mm -hmm. Nobody's having a good day when they come to emergency <laughs> for non-emergent complaints. And I think um, what we're witnessing right now with the burst of telehealth is it's leading to a lot of diversion from emergency departments, mm. and the pandemic has shown us that this has had a real effect on the bottom line. For we yeah. need those patients, yeah. right? We need the patients that are coming in for like a cold or a medication. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> They're giving us a good source of revenue yeah. without the cost. Yeah. So I think we need to be able to embrace it so that 
their care is within what we're providing yeah. into the emergency department and we can adapt and still capture some form of revenue from those patients. Uh, of course, like treating them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, remote monitoring, so we're now going into the digital health, yeah, yeah, remote yeah. monitoring and wearables is yeah, something very important. Um, and wear, wearables as part of remote monitoring, yeah. right? How do you make sure that patients are doing well when they're outside of the hospital? How do you make sure that they're um, uh, adhering to the care that they get? Yeah. This goes into prescription management. How do you make sure that patients yeah. are filling their prescriptions? They're actually getting them at the correct times, right? They're doing a, B, a TID or three times a day instead of twice a day. Um, and then into the field of uh, emergency mental health. Right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, mental health is a big crisis in emergency medicine or in America as a whole, and it's a um, rapidly accepted part of health in the world in general. And how do you provide a very limited resource to a huge population that needs it? Yeah. Right? So I think telehealth has a big, uh, uh, is going to have a very big impact and is having an impact as we speak. Yeah. We could go on and on. No, with, uh, <clears throat> no, no, we're also coming up uh, um, to the top of the hour, but there's there are more questions lining up. So. Uh, I think people were just waiting to. Okay, going over <laughs> like, if you want. To all know. right, so so I think the other question was also interesting, and there's some clarification that's been put over here. Do you think that hackathons have leveraged themselves from tech in terms of impacting human lives versus just monetary gains? Um, so I think the basis of hackathons is pure and remains pure in that you are finding a problem and you're trying to solve it. Mm. Um, and I think the monetary gain is an important, but uh, shouldn't be the overarching factor. And I'm not going to lie to you and say that we are in a place right now where people are doing things purely for its impact and not for um, I think it's OK to do both. At least my philosophy is it's okay to come up with a solution and get paid for it if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to think of the monetary gain. Mm -hmm. But I argue and I challenge people that are in this realm to look for successful solutions or startups that started out with monetary gain as the primary purpose. Mm -hmm. Because there are easier ways to make yeah. money. Right? <laughs> point. And there are easier ways to make a lot of money. And the few that actually make something impactful are doing it despite the large mm. monetary losses that they incurred in the beginning, mm. the challenges and the roadblocks that they uh, faced early on, that money on its own is not a good enough motivating factor. Fabulous. Now, 95% of people might be looking at it from a monetary aspect, yeah. and in the startup world, 95% people fail. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Put those Venn diagrams together, and I'll, <laughs> I'll argue that um, those solely for monetary gain are a big portion of uh, the <laughs> Cool. Okay. So, right. Okay. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Let's see. all right. What poten potential collaborations uh, or innovation exist in LMICs or EM? And does it always have to be from HIC to LMIC, or are there other possible collaboration routes? Oh my gosh, I please not from HIC to LMIC. <laughs> uh, you can't take problems that are suited for, like, like I said earlier on, every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it was designed to produce. Yeah. So um, what that means is basically if you take ways that have been working in high income countries and try to employ them in low middle income countries, um, you're going to produce results that are totally not empathetic to what's going on. That's true. There, right? And we've seen this in the NGO yeah. sphere a lot mm. before. You know, oh, this is great here. Mm. Let me take a solution and dump it mm. in low-middle-income countries, not let me go see what the problem in low-middle-income yeah. countries are and treat it from that specific lens. Um, so I think everything has to, every mm. intervention should take the, the host community in mind first. And the problem should be the center mm -hmm. and then the solution is tailored around it. Within mm -hmm. emergency medicine, of course. Now, I don't work in currently mm -hmm. in low middle income countries, so it's hard for me to think about what are the things that we could solve in low middle income countries. But there is such a large breadth and no shortage of 
problems that are facing emergency medicine and other fields, that there's so much to be solved mm -hmm. and not enough manpower, time, man woman power, time, <laughs> and resources to be able to tackle. Yeah. Um, so I think the concept of innovation is sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are problems abound. And I think it's definitely doable. That's an answer to cool. the question. Very nice. OK, so we're going to take one more question, and then we'll ask you to wrap up. I'm loving up. this. I want yeah. more questions. OK, <laughs> there is one more question, and then uh, you wrap it wrap it up for us with the message. OK, so um, Zayam's asking, what are some value-adding synergies you see as great case studies to learn more about innovation and its dissemination? Case studies, I would say, you know, hmm. so you can take case studies in terms of success mm -hmm. um, and let me put it this way so uh, some of the case studies we can do is we can see people who have started from the uh, hackathon space then go on to create good companies and then working backwards mm -hmm. um, it is kind of hard to see where they went mm -hmm. uh, because documentation is iffy early on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, right now, if you see a very successful company and search for it, they'll show you all the press releases from when they were listed on the stock exchange. Yeah. Much before that. Right. Um, but um, example from like the high middle income countries, finding some companies that were successful and seeing how they started, for example, PillPack is mm -hmm. a company that mm -hmm. started from, and it's in your book, I think, yeah. started from the hackathon space um, Augmetics is a company that is using a, leveraging AI to help with documentation. They started from mm -hmm. uh, a hackathon. And then in low middle income countries, there's a company called O2Metric, for mm -hmm. example, which um, helps titrate oxygen based on patient demand. Oh, um, mm -hmm. That is, was born out of winning a hackathon or one of the winners out of a hackathon out of Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Jugathon. Ah, Jugathon. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so those are case studies that you could look at. And then, um, there are, MIT Hacking Medicine provides a lot of good case studies, I think, yeah. um, for what is uh, what defines success. And then um, Assad is a very big resource right here for the case studies of things that oh. have been successful in uh, the hackathon <laughs> space as well. Yeah. In terms of innovation, I think it's a bit um, more difficult because you have to search for them. Uh, but I think it comes down to actual hospitals, specific hospitals that have done this thing before. So Stanford have done a lot in this space. Stanford Emergency Medicine, uh, MGH, the Mass General Hospital in Boston, they've got a lot in this space as well. And reach out to us at Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative. Yeah, we'll EMIC. Case studies as well. Reach out to uh, EMIC, Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative. It will uh, search it up, and then um, people who want to be connected directly to Z, is it yeah. okay if they, um, if they reach out to us, CCIT, oh, and yes, then please. we kind of redirect them to you? Um, yeah, so anyone who's interested in learning more about EMIC and what they're doing, the great work they're doing, uh, please reach out to, they can reach out to us and, and so on and so forth. So um, we're done with the time uh, and it, the hour went by pretty very easily, pretty easily, right? And so it's been a lot of fun uh, talking to Zed over here. And um, Zed, for all the speakers or panelists in these webinars, um, uh, we asked them to leave the audience uh, with a message or uh, in net or a few, or one more than one message could be one more than one message. But key takeaways or lessons learned from your journey. Um, sorry. Okay, and expertise as uh, so, there was a question. Yes. Your, uh, what would be some takeaways or lessons learned from your journey as a healthcare innovator and entrepreneur that you believe would be valuable for aspiring innovators and entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. Let's see, I think if I could distill three main takeaways from all of this, I would say primarily number one is focus on the problem, not the solution. So always make sure that you're coming at it from actually solving a real world problem, not trying to apply a solution that you think would be cool, even though they're more fun to think about. Hmm. I'd say it's very important in my mind to identify what your assumptions are, mm. and then working to dismantle them, right? Like this is where destruction comes from. See where you're uh, exactly think about your assumptions and dismantle them. And I think an important thing for me is don't shy away from hard problems. Um, easy problems are fine, um, but don't 
shy away from hard problems because they're challenging because I think that's a place where you can really make an impact. Um, so go for it. That was uh, nicely summarized. So once again, just to recap, uh, Zed saying focus on real world problems, okay, versus the solutions. Um, all the solutions could be a lot of fun to think through, which I agree with entirely. And uh, I've been guilty of working on the solution, all of us, okay. <laughs> right? Um, focus on your well. Think about your assumptions, right? Because I think a lot of times we're just kind of like basing off of our. Um, uh, thoughts or actions even on things you take for granted, right? Right? Take for for granted. So, so think carefully through what, what are the assumptions that you're basing off of your real world knowledge or about right uh, so so to say and then, and don't, then dismantle them they before. dismantle them exactly it's it's kind of like saying examining your assumptions and 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 not just like leaving it at that but dis dismantling yeah and, your assumptions your biases, your biases and yeah, yeah. Because that's where the perspective comes from, and that's why multidisciplinary teams are important. Yeah, because they don't come with these assumptions. And and yes, and and so and talking to other people, right? So having interdisciplinary teams, being really open to innovating and um, all of that, and then don't shy away from hard problems, because that's where the I think that's that's where the fun lies. Yeah, I agree. And uh, if nothing else, imposter syndrome is okay, and 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 saying I don't know, and that's what I do is I don't know. Right. Till the next time, right? And thank you very much, folks, uh, for listening, for dialing in and listening in. And uh, if you want to reach out, then uh, we've given you the information for that as well. And thank you, Zed. Thank and you for been, having me. It's this been, was a, it's been a so great much pleasure. Fun. Yeah. yeah. So. All right, bye. I think we will have to.